Psalm 32 is a beautiful psalm describing the blessedness of forgiveness, but not only forgiveness, but also the protection and the guidance that God gives. Now, in the Hebrew, the title for Psalm 32 is simply a Psalm of David, a contemplation. And the Hebrew word that is translated contemplation there is a maskil. And it might be better understood as instruction, at least according to some Bible commentators. And this is the first of 12 psalms with this title, a contemplation or a maskil. This psalm is full of instruction and contemplation, and it's worthy of meditation. We find this also in the psalm by the frequent repetition of Selah. It occurs three times in only 11 verses in this psalm. And Selah is a uh, encouragement, a call to pause, to meditate, perhaps also a musical interlude. Now, the psalm itself, I'm speaking of Psalm 32, does not tell us the specific occasion for this psalm in David's life. So we don't know exactly. In Psalm 51, uh, which was clearly written after David committed his sin uh, with Bathsheba and against Uriah, um, David promised to teach transgressors their ways, or your ways, Lord. That's in Psalm 51, verse 13. And this psalm may be the fulfillment of this vow, because this is the psalm of somebody who's been forgiven and is teaching others about the goodness of God in the midst of forgiveness. John Trapp, the Puritan commentator, said that Psalm 32 and Psalm 51 are tuned together. I like what G. Campbell Morgan said about Psalm 32. He said, it is a psalm of penitence, but it is also a song of a ransomed soul rejoicing in the wonders of the grace of God. Sin is dealt with, sorrow is comforted, ignorance is instructed. By the way, that's kind of a good outline for the psalm. Sin is dealt with, sorrow is comforted, ignorance is instructed. According to James Montgomery Boyce, in his commentary on Psalm 32, he says that this was Augustine's, or Augustine, however you want to pronounce his name, Augustine's favorite psalm. And uh, Boyce says that Augustine had it inscribed on the wall next to his bed before he died so that he could meditate on this psalm better. It's a wonderful psalm rejoicing in God's forgiveness. Here we go. Psalm 32 verses 1 and 2. We read here. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. I I love the way this psalm starts, don't you? Verse 1. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. David just simply spoke of the great blessing there is for the man or the woman who knows the forgiveness of God. Their sin is no longer exposed. It's not out in the open. It's not where where everybody can see it and look upon it. No, it is covered. Matter of fact, it's said there where it says blessed there in verse 1. It's actually in the plural in the original Hebrew. Spurgeon points out that it's really more like, oh, the blessednesses. The double joys, as Spurgeon said, the bundles of happiness, the mountains of delight. Now, I think of Psalm 32, and I sort of contrast it with Psalm 1. Psalm 1 tells us the way to be blessed. Don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Don't stand in the path of sinners, but instead delight in God's word. Think deeply on God's word all the time. But what do you do if you fail to do that? What if you've fallen into sin? Well, I love Psalm 32. Psalm 32 shows us another way to be blessed. That's to make full confession and repentance of sin and to receive God's great forgiveness. Now, again, in the title of this psalm in the Hebrew, it's a psalm of David, a contemplation. And David, the one who wrote this psalm, had great opportunity to know this blessedness in his own life. This great man of God, who was a man after God's heart, Nevertheless, he had some significant seasons of sin and what we might even call backsliding or spiritual decline. Notable among those periods were David's time at Ziklag, that's in 1 Samuel chapter 27, and then chapters 29 and 30. 
And then as well, David's sin regarding Bathsheba and the murder of Bathsheba's wife, or excuse me, husband, Uriah. That's in 2 Samuel 11. In each one of those occasions, David came to confession, repentance, and forgiveness. He knew the blessedness of being forgiven. David knew what it was like to be a guilty sinner. He knew the seriousness of sin, and he knew how good it is to truly be forgiven. David knew, as Paul would later state in Romans chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. You see, if David were judged on works alone, the righteousness of God had to condemn him. Nevertheless, he knew by experience, as it says in verse 1, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Then he continues on in verse 2, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. I want you to understand, David spoke of real forgiveness by the declaration of God, not merely the quieting of a noisy conscience or an imagined peace with God that isn't real. No, this is a standing with God that is declared, that is given by God. It is not earned, but it is declared by God. In the first two verses, David used three words to describe sin. The idea behind the word transgression in verse 1, that's crossing a line, it's defying authority. The idea behind the word sin in verse 1, that's falling short of or missing a mark. Then the idea behind the word iniquity in verse 2, that's the third word used. It's of crookedness and distortion. God takes all those ways that we sin against him. We cross his line. We defy his authority. We fall short of the mark. We miss the mark. We're crooked. We're distorted in all these ways. That is the depths of our sin. But in those first two verses, David also used three terms to describe what God does to put away sin. First of all, in verse 1, he uses the term forgiven. That has the idea of lifting a burden or a debt. Then he uses also in verse 1 the idea of covered. That's the idea of sacrificial blood covering over sin. And then in verse 2, the idea of does not impute. That's bookkeeping language. It means the sin does not count against the one. So if sin is described in three ways, transgression, sin, iniquity. Then it's also put away in three ways. It's forgiven. It's covered. It is not imputed. It's a beautiful, beautiful phrasing. Willem van Gemeren, in his commentary on Psalm 32, he says this, the psalmist declares that the forgiveness of sin of whatever kind, whether against God or man, whether great or small, whether conscious or inadvertent, whether by omission or commission, it is to be found in in God. Now, there is one sort of condition here in the first two verses. Did you notice it there in the very last line of verse two? It says, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. You see, the prior life of sin and double living was done for David. David was now a repentant and forgiven sinner. The forgiven life needs No more deceit to cover one's ways. Listen, friend, you know how it is. You know how much we have to deceive and cover our tracks when we decide to go our own way and sin against God. Uh, We we have to make sure that uh, our loved one doesn't get a hold of our phone because we, we don't want them to see who we're speaking to or what we're doing. But we have to make sure that people don't look at our browser history on whatever device or computer we use. We, we, we have to remember the lies that we've spoken. It becomes deception after deception, lie after lie. Listen, when we find true forgiveness in a clean page with God, there needs to be no more deceit. We just make a clean way now. Again, to quote Charles Spurgeon, in his wonderful commentary on the Psalms, the treasury of David. On Psalm 32, he says this, The lesson from the whole is this, Be honest, sinner. May God make you honest. Do not deceive yourself. 
Make a clean breast of it before God. Have an honest religion or have none at all. Have a religion of the heart or else have none. Put aside the mere vestment and garment of piety and let your soul be right within. Be honest and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Now, in verses 3 and 4, David's going to describe the agony of his sin when it was unconfessed, when it was hidden, before there was no deceit in him, before he repented. (laughs) These are great verses. Verses 3 and 4 of Psalm 32, David says this, When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. Selah. Did you see that in verse 3? When I kept silent, my bones grew old. The, The now forgiven David, because again, at the beginning of the psalm, he's forgiven. Now he's remembering what it was like before he received that forgiveness from God. The the, the now forgiven David remembered his spiritual and mental state when he kept his sin hidden. When he was silent instead of confessing and repenting, the stress of a double life, the stress of unconfessed sin made him feel old. It made him feel oppressed. It made him feel dry and wasting away. And if you notice the phrasing there, it's very interesting in verse 3. He kept silent. Not not only I was silent, but he kept silent. I'm going to keep silent with all my strength. And again, some of us know what this is like. You're you're hiding a sinful secret. You got to keep silence with all your strength. Dear friend, in the name of the Lord Jesus, let go of it. No longer keep the silence, but let go of it. Come and confess and repent. David was stubborn. He was going to hold on to silence the very best that he could. Even though, look at this in verse 4. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. Now, no doubt David was slow to acknowledge this. Yet in looking back, he understood that his misery was directly connected to the oppression of unresolved sin and rebellion against God. Lord, I look back and I see why I was so miserable. It's because your hand was upon me. It was heavy upon me and it was upon me day and night. David seemed to ache under the result of his sin. The result here was guilt and the lack of true fellowship with God. He's aching more under the result of his sin than the sin itself. Now, ideally, we're all terribly grieved by sin itself. But but there is something to be said for confession and humility just for the sake of the result of our sins. Lord, I don't want to suffer under your heavy hand upon me anymore. And he describes what that heavy hand was like going on in verse 4. He says, my vitality was turned into the drought of summer. David's dryness and misery was actually a good thing. It demonstrated that he was in fact a son of God and that the covenant God would not allow him to remain comfortable in habitual or unconfessed sin. Listen, the person who feels no misery, no dryness in such a state of sin and rebellion, that person has far greater concerns both now and in eternity. As Bishop Horn, that, that Anglican commentator says, he says, the pain of, of, of a strike upon a sore part, however terrible it is, it is well rewarded because it can affect a cure. And that was David. You see, the, the work of the Holy Spirit, convicting the man or woman of God of their sin and their hardness of heart, is an essential mark of those who truly belong to God. And the consideration of this work was so important that David gave the pause for consideration and meditation. He says there at the end of verse 4, Selah. Now continuing on into verse 5, he says, I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Selah. We go from a Selah at the end of verse 4, now to a Selah at the end of verse 5, and it is a well-deserved pause for meditation, because in verse 5, David confesses his sin. First, verse 5, he acknowledges his sin to God. Did you see that? 
I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. You see, David's first problem was the sin he committed. Now, in this context, let's just assume that it was the immorality with Bathsheba and and the murder of Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, that was made to cover his immorality with Bathsheba. Let's just assume that that was the sin. You, You see, that was the first problem, the sin itself. But the second problem was the double life that he lived in order to hide those sins. It was only as David was ready to repent and and the second problem, I'm no longer going to hide it. I'm going to acknowledge my sin to you. When David was ready to deal with the second problem, then God said he would graciously forgive the first problem. So I acknowledged my sin to you, verse 5, and my iniquity I have not hidden. And then in verse 6, he says, I will confess my transgression to the Lord. Excuse me, we're still in verse 5. I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Forgiveness was ready and waiting for David as he agreed with God about the nature and the guilt of his sin. That's really what it means to confess your sin. It's to agree with God about it. You see, when I stay in my sin, I'm sort of saying my sin is good and I need to hold on to it. But when I confess, I agree with God that my sin is bad, that it's destroying me, that it's offending a holy God, that I need to get it right before him. When he agreed with God about the nature of his sin and the guilt of his sin, then restoration was ready. But confession of the sin was the path to that restoration, that forgiveness, that cleansing. In the uh, Anglican world, at least the traditional Anglican world, there's a communion service in the English prayer book that the minister is instructed to give this invitation before the communion service. Here's what it says, quote, Come to me or to some other discreet and learned minister of God's word and open his grief that by the ministry of God's holy word he may receive the benefit of absolution or forgiveness. I love that phrase. And open his grief. That's what it is to confess our sin. We we become grieved over our sin and we open that up before God. Real, deep, genuine confession of sin has been a feature of every genuine awakening or revival in the past 250 years. But is it anything new? It didn't start 250 years ago. This is demonstrated by the revival recorded in Acts chapter 19 in the city of Ephesus. There in verses 17 through 20 of Acts 19, it says that many who believed came confessing and telling their deeds. That that, that was Christians getting right with God. And open confession was part of it. Now Spurgeon said, considering confession, he said, Oh, There are too many who make confession having no broken hearts, no streaming eyes, no flowing tears, no humbled spirits. Know you this, that 10,000 confessions, if they're made by hardened hearts, if they do not spring from really contrite spirits, shall only be additions to your guilt as they are mockeries before the Most High. Look, there is something offensive before God about false confession, feigned confession, shallow confession, but about true confession of sin as it's described there in verse 5. I've acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. That kind of real confession, that's a promise. That's a promise that that one who truly confesses will receive forgiveness. That's what it says at the end of verse 5. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. What? David, you committed adultery with a prominent woman in Israel. But he confessed and the Lord forgave the iniquity of his sin. David, you murdered her husband. But but he confessed and God forgave the iniquity of his sin. David, you set in motion so much other evil through that hiding of your sin for a whole year. Yeah, but he confessed and God forgave the iniquity of his sin. Now, understand, David's confession of sin did not 
earn the forgiveness of his sins. You do not earn forgiveness by your confession, but confession receives what God freely gives. And fellowship with God is restored. David confessed and he experienced this forgiveness immediately, just like the prodigal son in Jesus's parable in the gospel of Luke, just like the prodigal son confessed and was immediately embraced by the father. There was no probation. There was no wait and see period. The, the, the iniquity was forgiven. It's very worthy at the end of verse five that we have a selah. I, I meditate on this. I want you to meditate on it. I want you to be the one who confesses sin and receives God's forgiveness for it. Now, beginning in verse 6, he's going to talk about the blessing that comes to the forgiven sinner, the pardoned one. The blessings of protection and guidance. First, in verses 6 and 7, the blessing of God's protection. Ready? Here we go. For this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, they shall not come near him. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. Selah. And now for the third time in four verses, we have a selah at the end of verse 7. We had one at the end of verse 4 the one at the end of verse 5, and the one at the end of the verse 7, we meditate on the great blessing that God gives to the ones he forgives. That's why he starts off in verse 6. For this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you. Knowing that God is so great in forgiving mercy gives the godly person a greater reason to seek God in the confidence that God may be found and therefore ready to connect with his servant. In the midst of this, look at this, verse 6. Surely in a flood of great waters, they shall not come near him. David knew what it was like to be overwhelmed and mired in the guilt and misery of sin. And God could deliver him out of that crisis and raise him up above it to the place where he could cry out, proclaiming to God, You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. David here in verse 7 just sets one term upon another. David's glorying in the protection. He now felt as one in fellowship with God and under his care. Notice the phrases that he uses in verse 7. First, God was his hiding place, his secure shelter. You know, a good hiding place has strength. It has height. It's not easily seen. It's reliable. In modern phrasing, we might say that David is our safe room. He's our panic room. He's the one that we can uh, hide in, in the midst of the storm. But David also found security surrounded by God's own songs of deliverance, sung in the joy and confidence of victory. Yes, Lord, I, I, I just don't have deliverance. I can sing songs of deliverance. And then the idea of God as our hiding place is also associated with the idea of finding shelter in the house of the Lord, in the very presence of God. This is indicated by using the same Hebrew phrasing in two earlier Psalms. In Psalm 27, verse 5, it says this, For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle. And in Psalm 31, verse 20, it says, You shall hide them in the secret place of your presence. I think it's so interesting, and Spurgeon points this out, that the same man who in the fourth verse was oppressed by the presence of God, in in the fourth verse he says, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. (laughs) In the fourth verse, before he confessed his sin, David found his sin and the presence of God a burden upon him. Now, the presence of God is a shelter for him. This is the glory of confession of sin and true forgiveness of God. Now, in verses 8 and 9, God is going to appeal to his people to pay attention, to gain understanding. Look at this in verses 8 and 9. David says this. He says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will guide you with my eye. 
Do not be like the horse or like the mule, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with brit and bridle, else they will not come near to you. David here is speaking in the voice of God himself. He's prophetically speaking. This is God's voice unto his people. And God says, I will instruct you. I will teach you in the way that you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Isn't that a beautiful promise to God? To instruct us, to teach us, to guide his people. First of all, notice this. He says, I'll guide you with my eye. The idea there is of someone who waits upon another person so attentively that a mere look of the eye indicates their will. Illustrations commonly used for this, and I think it's a good illustration for it. It's of a butler waiting upon his master at dinner. The, The master only needs to look at the salt shaker, and the butler knows, I want salt, so he brings him the salt shaker. Uh, he, he looks at his cup that's only half filled. I know he wants his cup filled, so he fills his cup. You, you see, if we will look upon God, then he will guide us with his eye. God promises that for those who diligently seek him and focus upon him, he will guide them. And what a blessing this is from being forgiven and having fellowship restored. In David's season of guilt and misery, he did not, so to speak, look upon God for the guidance of his eye. He he kind of wanted a little bit of distance from God. He felt that God was pressing down upon him. God's hand was heavy upon him. But now, having been forgiven, when fellowship was restored, the blessing of such close relationship could be enjoyed all over again. Now, when you read some modern translations here in Psalm 32, verse 8, I will guide you with my eye. Many modern translations put the sense as merely God watching over the believer. And that's true. God watches over the believer. Yet since the context in the following lines regards guidance and responsiveness to the Lord, I think it's a fair translation here as the New King James and the King James Version have it. I will guide you with my eye. And that's why God says in verse 9, Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding. See, the horse and the mule are used as examples of animals that are not easily guided. They need the bit and the bridle. And sometimes they need a smack with a stick before they're going to be useful to the master. Adam Clark said it well. He said on this verse, The horse and the mule are turned with difficulty. They must be constrained with bit and bridle. Do not be like them. Do not oblige your maker to have continual recourse to afflictions, trials, and severe dispensations of providence to keep you in the way or to recover you after you have gone out of it. You see, it says there in verse 9, Else they will not come near to you. Now, what's interesting is David said that that's what the horse or the mule is like. They're not guided easily. If you don't smack them around a little bit, they won't come near to you. David understood that this described his condition in his season of unconfessed sin. He was like the dumb animal that could only be guided through pain or severity. In 1 Samuel 30, God allowed the Amalekites to devastate David and his men to bring him back from the period of backsliding at the very end of the book of 1 Samuel. And then in 2 Samuel chapter 12, God sent Nathan to speak sharply to David in the midst of his sin, again, to sort of knock David around a little bit, to knock some sense into him. Because like a dumb animal, David would not come near to God, as it says in verse 9, until these terrible experiences. God speaks to us through David's experience, and he says, listen, dear believer, do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding. No, may we as the people of God be in a better place and be guided by God's eye instead of needing to be disciplined in these ways from the Lord. Last two verses of this wonderful Psalm 32, verses 10 and 11. He says this, Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. 
You know, David knew what it was like to live, at least for a season, as the wicked. So he says, many sorrows shall be to the wicked. David knew the sorrows that come with living like a wicked person. But but he left that behind. And the repentant David then had a renewed experience of the mercy of God surrounding him. He who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. And then don't you love what he says there in the last verse? Be glad in the Lord and rejoice. You know, this psalm gives us repeated and compelling reasons uh, as believers to be glad, to rejoice, to shout for joy. The, the psalm appropriately ends with a call for God's people to remember and to respond to those reasons. It says, uh, be glad in the Lord and rejoice and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. So we remember. Remember the blessedness of forgiveness. Remember the release there is in leaving behind guilt and double living. Remember the protection that God gives to his people. Remember the guidance of the Lord. What a beautiful thing for us to do and to be rejoicing in the same way that David did in Psalm 32. As we've been concluding each psalm, we've asked a question, where do we see Jesus in these psalms? How do these psalms point to Jesus? Well, let me give you two ways that I see Psalm 32 pointing to Jesus. First of all, in verse 6, did you catch it where it said in verse 6? Everyone who is godly shall pray to you. You know, Jesus was the ultimate godly man who prayed. Sometimes we don't think about it enough. Jesus was a man of prayer. If you want to get a look at this, read through the Gospel of Luke and pay special attention to when it says that Jesus prayed. I mean, all the Gospels tell us that Jesus chose his disciples. Luke tells us that Jesus chose his disciples after he prayed all night. All all the um, the, uh, Gospels tell us about different occasions in the life of Jesus. In so many of them in the Gospel of Luke, Luke says that Jesus prayed before or during those occasions. Jesus was a man of prayer. And when it says in verse six, everyone who is godly shall pray to you, Jesus was and is that ultimate godly man who prayed. But then finally, for seeing how Psalm 32 points to Jesus, take a look at verse two. At verse two, it says this, blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. Now, I want you to consider that for a moment. Jesus was the opposite of this. Jesus was the man upon whom the Lord did impute iniquity. But listen, it wasn't his own iniquity. The iniquity that was imputed upon Jesus, the sin that was placed upon him, was my sin and your sin and the sin of humanity, the sin of God's people. That's what was placed upon Jesus Christ. And when I read verse 2 and when it says, blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, I say, Lord, you put that iniquity upon Jesus so that I could be blessed and forgiven. Thank you, Lord, that Jesus, you fulfilled the opposite of verse 2 so that I could fulfill the the, the exact words of verse 2 and be that blessed man. You know, in ancient Israel, when they brought an animal for a sin offering, they, they would bring a, a, let's say, a calf or a lamb sin offering. And the offerer, the person bringing the offering, would put their hands on the head of the animal and confess their sins. It was a very demonstrable way of transferring their sin onto that spotless animal because the animal was supposed to be as perfect as it could be, no spot or deformity or blemish that that was a recognizable picture of the ultimate sacrifice that God would one day bring, the perfect one on whom God would impute iniquity. And in the midst of all that, we can be blessed with forgiveness because Jesus had our sin placed upon him. Praise the name of Jesus. I pray, and I'm going to pray right now, that you would know this blessedness of forgiveness. Father in heaven,
as we read such a wonderful psalm like Psalm 32, we can't help but be struck, be deeply impressed with the blessedness of the one who's forgiven, with the blessedness of the one who, who is protected by you, guided by you after they are forgiven. So Lord, I pray, I pray that you would help each one of us to confess our sins with you, to stop double dealing with you and before others, but just to make a clean sheet of it all before you and receive the beautiful forgiveness that you offer us in Jesus Christ because he bore the guilt and the shame and the judgment that my sin and the sin of everyone who's forgiven the sin and the shame we deserve to bear. He bore it for us. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for the blessedness of forgiveness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.